Okay. So our next speaker is uh, Shankar Krishnan. Uh, he's a scientist at Google Research. Uh, he uh, used to be a scientist at Bell Labs before that. And he'll be talking about the lost landscape of deep networks. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, today I'll be talking about uh, some recent work I did with uh, my intern, Behrouz Gorbani from Stanford, and my colleague at Google, uh, Ying Zhao. Um, uh, before I start, I wanted to just uh, encourage all of you to ask as many questions as possible, just so that we can have a lively discussion, even if it's a stupid question, that nothing is stupid here. Um, so let me start with some very simple um, definitions. Uh, we all know what deep networks are. Uh, in this talk, I'll be restricting myself to the supervised setting uh, for machine learning, where you're given a static data set of some number of points, and you are given a task, and you are learning some kind of uh, latent representation and then classifying it or regressing to some particular output. Um, so this is well known. Um, and typically, there is a loss function that uh, you're trying to optimize in order to generate your model that you can then use for um, inference and in other unseen data. So uh, just to give some idea of what kind of statistics we'll deal with, uh, the modern deep networks, the feed forward setting, you have the networks that are extremely deep, uh, ResNets, the residual networks, they are usually 100 or 1,000 layers deep uh, in many of the vision tasks. They are highly overparameterized. The number of parameters approaches uh, about 100 million uh, for about a million data points. So in this setting, um, you pretty much can learn anything you want of, in terms of the training data set. So the losses are fairly complicated, uh, but then you use one of the most simplest brain dead schemes to optimize a function, SGD, and you get to, at least theoretically, you can get to zero training error, which means you can't do better than that. Um, some people have um, conjectured that this means you're memorizing the data set and it's really not learning anything um, more meaningful or semantic about the data itself. But I'll leave that aside for later now. Uh, the other part about SGD is that um, for problems of this scale and the dimensionality, uh, in order to get to a certain error in terms of the gradient norms, uh, your iteration complexity is really poor. Uh, there are some schemes that are better than this, uh, like variance reduced methods, uh, but those are typically not to train modern networks. Um, in spite of all this, you train for some time, you stop whenever you feel like, and then you see that it actually generalizes pretty well to unseen data. So why is that? Uh, we have no idea. Most people have conjectured a few um, possible reasons and uh, yet to be established, I would say. But the fact that you can generalize so well accounts for most of the success in modern machine learning tasks. So as I said, SGD is fairly simple. It's one of the easiest things to implement uh, and cheap. There's a low per iteration complexity. And it's one of the few simple optimization methods that actually can be um, deployed in practice. Um, but as I said, it suffers from very slow convergence. And so people have made several claims about what's going on. So one of the um, pioneers in machine learning, Ian Goodfellow, in his book has written that practitioners attribute nearly all the difficulty uh, with res uh, in deep network optimization to local minima. Uh, prior to that, there was a theory floating around which said that a deeper and more 
profound difficulty originates from the proliferation of saddle points, not local minima. Such saddle points are surrounded by high aero plateaus that can dramatically slow down learning. And more with respect to the generalization aspects of deep networks, uh, Keskar et al. and earlier Hockreiter and Schmidhuber had suggested that large batch stochastic methods tend to go towards sharp minima, while small batch methods converge to flatter minima, and the flatter minimizes, minimizers tend to generalize better. The reasoning behind that is that if you perturb your data or your parameters by, uh, say, taking off a training point or probably introducing another training point, the loss does not change that much. Um, in spite of all this, you would think that there might be, there are so many methods in the literature to speed up optimization. You could use higher order information. So there have been attempts made in this area. Um, in general, they have worked out, either because they are too expensive, uh, so not practical, or um, they just don't do very well. I, I would contend that both are true. So why is this happening? Why, why aren't we able to do any better than that? So that's kind of why this study was started. Uh, we wanted to understand what is in the loss landscape of these um, loss functions that tend to favor some simple method like SGD and uh, not be amenable to more complicated and more sophisticated methods. So, if you, so we want to see if there's any hope of speeding up optimization, understanding what generalization performance relates to the loss landscape, and even can you modify architectures by selecting some desirable features on your loss landscape? And in order to do all this, one particular thing that we would like to understand is some kind of uh, the curvature of the loss surface. At least that's one property that we could study other than the gradient information which we already have. And that involves the Hessian of the loss surface. So what I'll be talking about is some way to characterize all the information that these Hessians have in the lost land by looking at some uh, information about the spectrum of the Hessian. So uh, what are the main challenges? One is, as I told you, these networks are huge. So the dimensionality of the Hessian is enormous. So any naive approaches will not work. Second, um, at least in the deep network setting, we do not have access to the elements of the Hessian. We cannot store them. So we need some kind of a matrix-free approach. Um, so people have actually looked at this uh, in several settings. More recently, there's been an active area of research. Um, so group in Facebook has been looking at this for some time, and they have published a few papers. So what they have done over the past few um, years have been to look at very small uh, uh, MLPs, like multi-layer multi perceptrons, and uh, looked at the exact Hessian, and then calculated the spectrum as it goes along during optimization. Um, another class of uh, papers look at the extreme eigenvalues of the Hessian, typically using uh, power method or Lanchos, and uh, trying to argue something about where the uh, parameters go as the optimization proceeds, just in terms of the extremal eigenvalues. Um, more recently, uh, uh, people have tried to look at projections of the loss surface and tried to characterize the curvature uh, in that setting. Um, we don't know if that, that can be used in order to determine some notion of flat versus sharp minima, and people take different sections around your parameter values and look for uh, loss value changes. Uh, the last and probably the most ambitious attempt uh, at this has been um, by a group from uh, Princeton and Google, 
they have tried to look at a Chebyshev polynomial approximation to estimate the Hessian spectrum. Um, what they do is they estimate some form of a density, the spectral density, and try to approximate it with a Chebyshev polynomial. Um, uh, since this is the most relevant work to compare with ours, I'll be presenting some results comparing our work with this. Yeah. So, few things. One is, uh, as your optimization proceeds, what happens to the spectra of the Hessian? Second, does the spectra exhibit any trends? Like, you'll see some experiments to show what happens as optimization proceeds, and what does it correspond to in terms of optimization? Can you characterize what does the op why does the optimization slow down? Can you answer questions like this? You can answer using the eigens values of this. That is a very good question. Nobody knows the exact answer to that. People have a gut feel for what a sharp point or a flat point looks like. Um, if I were to draw a picture, a flat line would look like this, a sharp line would look like this. But this is completely meaningless because you can reparameterize your network and transfer sharpness and flatness without any change to anything else. So it's a completely uh, informationless statement, but it has been it has gained significant traction in the community. People buy that and they use that as justification for some of their methods. <clears throat> um, so we uh, propose an alternative uh, solution, which is based on Gaussian quadrature um, for the estimation of the eigenvalues. Um, so we actually provide a highly accurate estimate of the full batch loss Hessian spectrum. So one thing before I start, what I'm going to be talking today is I'm not taking an unbiased estimate of the Hessian. I'm actually looking at the full Hessian. Um, and I'll come back to that because that is an issue of as a, as a weakness of our approach, but I'll tell you why we had to make that choice. Um, so as part of this, you for free the extreme largest and smallest eigenvalues up to floating point accuracy. And in this turn, you can also compute moments of your distribution. Uh, it can compute the top subspace in the same process. And for the first time, as far as we know, we have applied it to actual real networks. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of that. Um, and a significant portion of the effort was spent by my intern uh, developing the software to, be, to efficiently implement this in a machine learning system like TensorFlow. And, uh, most within a few months, we will open source this so that anybody else can use it. Uh, we think it's a useful tool to have uh, in order to analyze your problems. So if there are no more questions, uh, I'll continue, but I'll wait for a minute. OK, so uh, typically, like if you look at stochastic gradient descent, you would take a mini batch of examples, compute a gradient, and descent, right? Um, that has variance in your estimate. You could do the same with your Hessian. You could take a mini batch and compute that. The claim that we are making is that gives you absolutely no information about what you care about. And we are kind of forced and backed into a corner to use the entire data set. Um, you, of course, you can take some. Uh, uh, leeways in order to make it efficient by taking half the data points, but in essence, you're using the full data set. Okay, so uh, some s definitions. Uh, let H be your Hessian, uh, and lambda 1 to lambda n are your eigenvalues, and QIs are your eigenvectors. So how do you estimate your spectrum? A simple way to write this is um, using the uh, 
expression above, you can write it as a sum of uh, Dirac delta functions. Uh, and this is the empirical eigenvalue density. Um, however, um, this is not a proper function in the analytic sense. So it will be hard to compare or make any claims about how good your approximation is. Um, so this is done typically, like I mentioned before, we calculate a spectral density by essentially convolving it with a kernel of some sort. And in our case, we'll choose a standard uh, Gaussian kernel. And sigma is the bandwidth parameter of the kernel. And that choice determines how accurate, how faithful you are to your spectral, uh, true spectral distribution. Um, I'll come back to that again later in terms of what kind of values are typically used and when things break down. So this is just to give you a mental picture for what we'll be computing. This is like a very toy example where we have some eigenvalues between uh, minus one and one, the red lines and oops, and the spectral, true spectral density looks like the blue curve. So this is what you'll see in plots that I'll show later on. Um, and this is in some sense close to your histogram estimation in some sense. So here is how uh, our algorithm proceeds. So um, we define our um, spectra, uh, our spectral distribution phi with respect to sigma as essentially a sum over these convolved kernels. And uh, there is a simple way to show that this sum is same as the trace estimate of your uh, the function applied to the Hessian directly. So it's a trace of the Hessian, the function applied to the Hessian. And um, you can convert that trace into an expectation by hitting the uh, matrix function with random vectors V, which are chosen such that they have zero mean and uh, they have unit um, covariance. Um, are people familiar with this Hutchinson estimator? Um, so the idea is fairly simple. So if it is not clear, then if you want to look at expectation of V transpose, let's say HV. So, and now we want to compute the trace of this. So this essentially will, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I made a mistake. So, so trace of H is same as trace of HI, which is trace of expectation of H. VB transpose, and by the trace formula, we can write this as expectation of V transpose HV. And so, um, what th that's the Hutchinson uh, estimator, and it's being used quite often in the literature to do trace estimation. Uh, the good thing about this is it's actually a very friendly method as the dimensionality increases. Usually you hear about the curse of dimensionality. In this particular case, it's actually a benefit. So you can hit it with very few vectors and your concentration becomes really strong. So you get very good estimates of your trace by just using very few Bs and computing expectation. Um, so the other thing uh, I wanted to mention here was that if you uh, write the um, expression here, you can also write it in terms of the projections of Vs into the eigenbasis of your H. If you write H as Q times some lambda diagonal matrix times Q transpose, then you can combine them in, an, in a simple way and ca call these as coefficients beta i. So 
Now, we can write the same thing as an integral from, uh, uh, this is called, uh, this previous summation can be written as an integral. This is called uh, the riemann stages measure. And this is the measure on this. And it's like a precursor to the Lebesgue measure. So you can write the same formula as an integral. And this is where the advantage happens. So, sorry. Once you can write your estimator, phi v, as an integral, you can approximate it by Gaussian quadrature. So just briefly, I want to get into what uh, Gaussian quadrature is in case no, somebody is not, not familiar with it. So if you have an integral that looks like this, where w is a positive weight function, then we can approximate the integral with a summation. So uh, the summation is done at some specific points, w, i, and theta i. And um, these values, theta i, are between a and b. And the interesting thing about the Gaussian quadrature method is that as long as your polynomial f, uh, as long as your function f is a polynomial of degree less than or equal to 2m minus 1, you just need to choose m weights w i theta i that will compute the integral exactly. So um, maybe this is uh, too heavy, but uh, essentially what I am saying is the same thing. We had this expectation over five v's that we can now write. Now let us let me tell you that let us assume we know where the quadrature nodes and weights are. For, I haven't told you yet how to do that, but suppose you know what how to do it. We use this summation now, uh, and this expectation becomes essentially a summation over the number of vectors you hit it with, and that is our approximation. Okay, this is how we compute the spectrum. So here's where Lancho's method comes in. So for people who are unfamiliar with Lancho's, this is a method used, it's a Krylov subspace approach to solve things like symmetric linear systems of sorts. Um, typically, you have a matrix H, and you create polynomials of, it's called the Krylov subspace, which is essentially take a random vector x and hit it with H several times, and the subspace spanned by those vectors by a Krylov subspace. And what Lancho's algorithm does, it creates, a, a, an, it creates an orthonormal basis of your Krylov subspace in the form of Q, so that Q times your matrix A, uh, H times Q transpose HQ is a tridiagonal matrix. And, and this tridiagonal matrix with your eigenvectors are what you use to solve a system up to m nodes. Suppose you, uh, if you, if you, if m is equal to the size of the matrix, then you get a full Krylov subspace, so you solve your system exactly, but you can stop at any point in time. Um, the key result we use is an old result from Golub and Welch in 1969, where uh, the, they've, they proved that if you compute the Lanchos for m steps, uh, the, and you get these as the eigenvectors of the matrix T. Remember that T is now just a tridiagonal matrix of size m by m. So it's a very small matrix if m is small enough. And uh, then the quadrature formula for choosing the weights and these uh, quadrature nodes looks like uh, you just select the first component of UIs and then the eigenvalues themselves. So that's it. So this is the key result that we use in order to compute our spectral density. So this is the entire algorithm. We draw several Vs, hit it, uh, do Lanchos on them, calculate the um, thetas and Ws from the method I described, and that will give me all the quadrature nodes I need to compute this expression. Okay. So this is the entire up method. So one thing that we can show is that um, if you, now we can, because phi sigma looks like an analytic function, we can look for error bounds in terms of the approximation. 
And what we can show is that the probability this deviates too much uh, from an epsilon parameter goes down exponentially. So it is extremely tight and it converges very quickly. So here is a very simple verification of our approach. So here we just took a two layer uh, MLP for MNIST. Uh, we just sampled like 5,000 points of the MNIST data. Uh, the number of parameters is about uh, 15,000. And uh, this is, the, the red curve is the estimate, and the black curve, I hope you can see, it's right on top of it. That's the exact spectral density. And uh, in this particular setting, we use the bandwidth parameter as 10 to the minus 5, and we do 90 Lancho steps. So that's the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, no, it has nothing to do with that. Yeah. Gaussian quadrature is just a separate method in order to compute integrals by doing the, uh, the summation, the replacing that. The quadrature, that rule is separate, but the, it so happens that I'm using a Gaussian kernel. It's just a concept. No, I think Gauss was everybody. Yeah. He did everything, yeah. Yeah, but then you will lose any of your analytic properties, but you're right, yeah? How? Oh, um, very good question. So um, in deep networks, um, you can compute, uh, as I said, we don't need access to the Hessian fully. All I need when I was doing Lanchos is to multiply Hessian with a vector, HV. Yeah. Uh, so it is a simple, it's just like a gradient computation on your, uh, on your gradient dot producted with the loss, uh, with V. So we are essentially computing gradient with respect to W of this will give you HV. Okay. And uh, in most of uh, these automatic differentiation systems like TensorFlow, this is just as expensive as one gradient computation. So even though a Hessian vector product typically would be quadratic or the size of the number of nodes, uh, n squared, this is linear. So it's actually cheaper to do this. Uh, and here is an example of the extremal eigenvalues. As you can see, it is picking out these things quite precisely. So the accuracy of the quadrature approximation, so we varied both sigma as well as the number of nodes of your Lanchos method. And typically, um, as your smoothness parameter approaches like around 10 to the minus five, we can get away with about 90 nodes. The, uh, if we are allowing much, um, say, loser, as sigma increases, the function becomes much smoother, so you can get away with fewer uh, Lancho steps. Um, but you can see that um, in order to get to somewhere near machine precision, it's good to do like um, sigma of around 10 to the minus 5 and around 90 nodes. So all our experiments that we do uh, is with these two choices of parameters. So I mentioned that the Shebichev approximation approach uh, was probably the most competitive in terms of its ambition. It was also trying to estimate the full spectral density. So here is what happens um, near zero. Like I told you the, um, in, in the previous example, or it's right here. So most of the uh, bulk of your eigenvalues are very centered around zero. And near this point, the Chebyshev polynomial approximation breaks down quite a bit. And typically, you get a nice property in some interval further away from zero, but not at zero. So you can see the approximation is pretty poor. This is with a degree 90 polynomial approximation, which is like doing the same amount of work that we are doing. And this is the spectral approximation that you'll get, the red one, if you use the Chebyshev uh, method. 
Um, again, if you want to do the fit the Gaussian kernel, uh, it will take you approximately 500 degree polynomial to even come close. And then there is this other ringing property called the Gibbs phenomenon that um, actually uh, disobeys this non-negativity property of your approximation because it goes up and down around zero. So this is uh, probably a reason why we think the Chebyshev approximation is not that suited for the problem that we are trying to solve. So a case study for a real network, I, I mentioned earlier that, yeah. Because they could do some very interesting math. Um, so one thing with the Chebyshev expansion, which we can also do here, is you can get an unbiased estimate of your density, um, but it has very high variance. And uh, they were able to use some kind of important sampling to mathematically show that your error will go towards zero as your batch size or your uh, variance goes down by one over square root n. So they could do some very interesting math with it, but it's not a viable use. Um, for something like a network of this size, you need almost, almost a million degree polynomial to come close to their estimates of errors that they care about. So, so, um, so we looked at this ResNet32 CIFAR10 example, uh, which is uh, an actually uh, a state-of-the-art model roughly for CIFAR10. It has about half a million parameters. Um, we trained this uh, for about 100,000 steps. Uh, we compute the spectrum at various checkpoints. Um, so at Google, we have access to a lot of resources, but I just wanted to mention that for this particular case, we use only 10 GPUs, not more than that. Um, we compute a full batch Hessian vector product in about 11 seconds. And um, it takes about 16 minutes to do 90 Lancho steps. So one checkpoint, uh, we can compute the entire spectrum in about 16 minutes. And um, this is the training schedule that we used for our approach. So this is how the spectrum looks uh, at, at step zero. This is when you initialize it randomly. So you can see that, again, there's a lot of zero eigenvalues. There are some positive, and then there are a bunch of negative eigenvalues. You run um, SGD for about 1,000 steps. This is what happens. Almost all the negative eigenvalues disappear. You are almost in a convex regime. This is what I was trying to tell you, why this is useful. Now, what happens after this is uh, quite interesting. And this is after about 42,000 steps. The loss becomes small. But pretty much, it is in a very small, flat region with the maximum eigenvalue less than half. And the smallest eigenvalue is this big. So you could think of your optimization landscape after a few iterations of SGD as almost in a weekly convex radiation setting. And now you can, and the reason things slow down, in our opinion, is because of conditioning problems. So once your conditioning becomes small, uh, bad, SGD suffers. Everybody knows that. And so remember I showed you quotes earlier in the talk where I said people talked about saddle points, a plethora of local minima that is causing problems. None of that is happening. It's a pure, simple case of badly conditioned convex setting, at least around the region that the uh, trajectory of the optimization is proceeding. So this is like the maximum eigenvalues and minimum eigenvalue as you approach the, uh, as you perform various iterations. So now the question is, is it always this nice? What happens if you change things a little bit? People have a lot of hyperparameters in deep networks, the learning rate, certain uh, places of when to drop the learning rate, and so on. People have developed some intuition, but it's purely a manual task. So we decided to change the initial learning rate from 0.1 to 0.5 and leave the rest same. We changed this a little bit. And now the largest eigenvalue starts going way up. Um, oh. So typically, the learning rate um, for uh, you slowly learning, typically you go down uniformly. But 
for actual training, you take like a step like function. That's what happened. So we tried it on three different rates. And for three different rates, the final point at which it rested looks very different. At rate zero, at rate one, it looks fairly flat, like the one I showed you. And at rate three, it looks fairly bad. The max eigenvalue is seven. Uh, that's still not very bad, but I'll show you some examples where it can get really bad. Now, so far I use SGD and momentum to train my network. What if I use something that people use a lot these days called ADAM? It's an adaptive method that changes the learning rate per parameter using first and second moments of your gradient um, values. Um, see what happens as the training proceeds. The max eigenvalue is hovering around 1,000. So this is into a very sharp zone where this is actually in a pretty uh, bad regime. Um, here is another cracker as far as deep network optimization is concerned. Adam actually does a great job of optimizing the training loss. It's about half of that of what SGD does, but the validation performance or the uh, that is about 20 percent points less than what SGD has. So this is another reason. We don't have to be super efficient with our optimization. We just need to know where to end up, where the loss could be big, but your, your surface properties are somehow amenable to generalization. So these are what kind of things that either we suspected or we knew, but we can never confirm. Now comes the other thing. People in the morning, somebody talked about layer normalization. So batch normalization is a, do I have two minutes? OK. OK, great, thanks. Um, so batch normalization is a, a, a kind of a transformation or reparameterization of your network um, such that uh, it does some crazy things. Uh, I don't know how many people know about this and have dealt with this a lot. But essentially what they do is they take the activations that come out of every layer, they whiten it based on the mini batch statistics. It has nothing to do with anything other than how you choose your mini batch and then transform this so they have unit uh, zero mean unit variance for that mini batch. And then once they do that, they apply this scaling and bias term, almost as if they want to undo whatever they did, just in case the algorithm wanted to do it. Okay, so this is a nonlinear transformation um, right away. And this has proven to be one of the most seminal ideas in machine learning in the last five years. It has changed the way people train. Um, ImageNet, which is one of the larger image models, used to take uh, somewhere between three weeks to about uh, a month or even two months, depending on the architecture. And this uh, introduction of this brought it down to about three days. So this is one of the most powerful techniques um, that was introduced in 2015, and people still don't know what it does and why it behaves so well. Um, so let me show you what happens when your density, the examples I showed you earlier were with batch norm, and this is one of the examples where at a particular uh, point in the checkpoint, your spectrum looks like this with batch norm, and without batch norm, your spectrum looks like this. Look at the largest eigenvalue. It's about 500 times bigger. So clearly, batch norm is doing something to the loss surface, which is making it much smoother or making it more amenable to first order methods. The question is what? And so far, nobody has been able to give a, a satisfactory reason for this. Um, so, so there have been some conjectures. So the person who wrote the paper for batch normalization uh, said that it reduces something called an internal covariate shift. That was his justification to do this transformation. It turns out that not only is that doesn't inform us in any meaningful way, it actually is not happening. There is internal covariate shift even with batch norm in this. 
So whatever he felt like he wanted to do, somehow he's not doing it, but it's still doing something magical. More recently, people have looked at the, um, a more theoretical look at this, uh, at batch norm. And Alex Madri and uh, Santurkar uh, from MIT, they looked at this um, from a more theoretical setting where they said that it reduces the smoothness of the loss function. And by that, they meant that the Lipschitz constant goes down, which allows it to be trained faster. Um, like I showed you in the examples, it actually looks like it's true. The maximum eigenvalue is much smaller. But um, this is not a very satisfactory explanation because you could just scale your loss function arbitrarily and change your Lipschitz constant. It doesn't really affect how easy or difficult your optimization problem to have, um, changes. So they haven't given a good answer to it either. This is something we think about. Um, we think that what it's actually doing is decoupling the interaction between the layers. So you can see that if you have a deep linear network, um, the influence of a particular weight in a layer i affects everything that comes behind it. And SGD has absolutely no idea. It'll just apply gradient as if it's a normal function. Now, if um, the values and the gradient flows backwards, so if I have an expression like x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, just simple scalars, the simplest linear deep network, then the partial with respect to x1 is this term. So if all of these are big, then the gradient of x1 will explode. And if any of them are tiny, then it will never learn anything. What we think batch norm is doing is by resetting the statistics in between every layer, it's decoupling the, um, the gradient information and restricting it to just these two values. So everything that you need to know about the gradient here comes only from the gamma and the beta parameters that are happening there. And what I think it does is these long range effects of the Hessian, which is trying to measure how layer I affects layer J, those things are broken somewhat. That is our feeling. We have no idea to know whether that's true. But if that is true, that will be some kind of an explanation. But what we would like theoreticians to look at is can we formalize this in some way, even for a linear network, a two-layer network. If we can say something about this, that will be fantastic. Now the question happens, since this thing is a bit of a mystery, um, can we replace it? Can we mimic the performance somehow? So we can say possibly. Uh, we already said that the thing enters some kind of a convex regime, but the conditioning is poor. Can we just do some simple preconditioning? We have the information we need. We have the ability to compute the spectrum and some top subspace. Can we use that and uh, essentially modify the gradients accordingly? One thing we found is, and it's easy to show uh, mathematically, that in the case of simple MLPs, the gradients are restricted to a very small subspace, and it is, aligns itself with a very high curvature subspace of the Hessian. Here is the example. Without batch norm, you can see that the gradients lie in the top 10 subspace of the Hessian, and most of the energy is right there. It's, of course, not true when it comes to the stuff with batch norm, and which is why preconditioning might not be that useful when batch norm is present. So a possible approach is just compute the 10-dimensional subspace, like what I described, using the quadrature method. We dampen the gradient components in this subspace and rescale the orthogonal gradient component, see if we can do any better. So here's what happens when you do this. This is the black curve is SGD on a non-batch norm network without any preconditioning. And the red curve is the one with preconditioning. 
I have added the batch norm curve. It looks like batch norm is doing much better anyway, but there's a small uh, catch here. The losses are not comparable, so because it changes the loss values. But you can see that if you look at the precision, it actually reaches 100% precision faster than with batch norm. So this suggests that there might be something uh, to doing preconditioning. The other thing is, this is of course just training. How does it perform with eval? And what we see is that this achieves like 91.5% on CIFAR 10 with ResNet 32, but the state of the art is 92.5. So we are about 1% less than what batch norm gets to, but we are in the ballpark. The last thing I want to talk about is, we, we, we did all this work, um, then we, somebody asked us, what else are you going to use this for? And we got to start thinking and saying, hey, I didn't know about this. So one thing that came uh, last year was this idea called influence functions. Um, an influence function is a very nice idea. It kind of tells you if you have a model that you don't know what happened, who trained it, all you can give is an input and see an output. So it's like a black box. Can you understand what is happening in there? So this is the paper by Ko and Liang in ICML 2017. So think of this as a convolutional network. You feed an MNIST digit six, and say it says, the classifier says it's five. Now you want to know why. So um, they analyze this for smooth, strongly convex functions. And they say that suppose you train this model to a local optimizer, like theta star. Now you remove a single example xi from your training set and retrain the whole thing, and let theta minus i be the new minimizer. The influence of xi is how much the parameters moved. If it moved a lot, then this is very useful, otherwise it's not. Um, the thing that they made a big contribution is that they uh, gave a closed form solution to estimate this without having to retrain the model again. And the closed form, uh, so I'm not going over what that form is, that looks more like this half, but what is more interesting for us is suppose you take a point, a test point X that comes with some answer, and if you want to understand which training points were most responsible for its output, then this is the expression that um, they gave. This is a fairly easy expression um, to compute. Notice that you have this Hessian inverse gradient L form. We think that this, we can use our method to compute on the, at least the inverse on the top K subspace, and then compute importance at least approximately. We haven't done that yet, but that's something that we want to do. Um, so in conclusion, um, so, this method has a lot of limitations, right? Um, I've already said that, one, it's linear in the batch size. So you have to train, uh, you have to do this algorithm with the entire batch, not just a uh, mini batch. Uh, why is that? Because the variance in your Hessian estimates are too big, and naive subsampling does not work. Um, if you just want the top one subspace, there's a method called Oja's method, and uh, Pratik here had an interesting result on top of that, where he improved Oja's method in terms of this streaming setting, where you have, you can use just the sto stochastic estimates of your matrix and estimate the top eigenvector. Um, the top K subspace, we don't know of any result, concentration bounds that are better than the simple davis kahan sine theta method theorem it says that it's roughly proportional to the norm of the perturbation of your matrix, the true versus the stochastic matrix, and it also depends on an eigengap between lambda k and k plus one. So that is a very pessimistic bound, and if you want to use that, we pretty much might use the entire batch. Um, I talked to Pratik today, and he said there is a follow-up work by Alan Zhu, who has kind of uh, taken their method and applied it to the top k subspace, and I'm excited to read that paper. So the current approach was designed only as a tool to inspect the Hessian after training. Um, but then the ML community believes that the flatness and sharpness uh, are correlated with generalization performance. 
So one thing that we could see is, can we design some kind of a trace norm regularizer of your Hessian and compute gradients through it to guide optimization to the right place? This is akin to some kind of Langevin dynamics that people have suggested to take it to flatter regions. Um, so far, we don't know if there are any connections to that yet. Um, thank you for listening. I uh, appreciate any questions, please. Yeah, uh, now I'm aware of some recent results that show convergence uh, if you add a Lipschitz uh, constant uh, <laughs> a regularization term uh, to, you know, uh, to the loss function. Uh, you mean like a weight decay term? Uh, sorry? Uh, no, no, it isn't a weight decay. It's, uh, it's actually a Lipschitz norm. Uh, you know, which, uh, okay. you know, which is, I mean, written in terms of various gradients of weights and so on, right? So, uh, I mean, I, I was wondering if you, if, uh, if you can draw any connection between that and the uh, yeah, properties I of Yeah, I don't Asia. know how they estimated the Lipschitz bound because right. this is the only way I know how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, that if they have some nicer way or if there is a right, yeah, case... No, let's let's be uh, you know interesting uh, to take a look. Uh, discuss that offline. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. If not, let's thank the speaker. Thank